start off with a case um, just to highlight some of the reasons why to go posterior. So this is a 30-year-old male who was involved in a motor vehicle accident. He has no medical history um, and then um, has pain around the right knee. Uh, here her is uh, AP and lateral x-rays of the tibia. You can see a, pro um, a fibula fracture. And then something doesn't just look right uh, with the proximal tibia. We'll get a CT scan uh, with the three cuts, the axial, coronal, and sagittal. And I would like to um, turn your attention to the axial cut, which is the most important cut where you see a posterior medial as well as a posterior lateral fragment um, um, on the axial cut. And that's really uh, important to see because that will probably guide your surgical approach to say, well, I do not have to go lateral, so I probably should go prone because um, um, uh, to really try to capture the, the posterior lateral fragment. Here are some 3D reconstruction cuts where you can again see the posterior lateral component of this uh, proximal tibia fracture. And intraoperatively, um, it is incredibly important that before you start any posterior approaches, you check your fluoroscopy because uh, it is incredibly um, challenging if uh, the contralateral leg is in the way and you cannot see your uh, lateral. And that will require um, appropriate bumps and, and uh, uh, in the right location to, to keep the um, x-ray clear of the other leg. And here you can see the, the, the plate application capturing both segments, the posterior medial and posterior lateral fragment. So how do you get there? So there's a, a couple of different described techniques. I'll go through some of them. The Lobenhofer uh, approach um, is essentially somewhat similar to the uh, posterior medial approach that uh, Greg just covered. It is essentially in the prone position, you uh, find the medial border of the tibia and make about a six to eight centimeter long incision along the medial head of the grass rock and, um, and then dissect down to the fascia. You can also do that on the posterior lateral side, um, um, as alluded earlier today, where you just essentially uh, do the same idea. You, you go along the posterior lateral or around the lateral um, head of the gas truck. You do have to find the common perineal nerve to really um, protect it. And in case where the main fracture line is um, right behind the fibula head, you can also empl employ a fibula osteotomy. These are some clinical pictures. Here you can see the patient in the prone position. Um, and then usually uh, you uh, mark out your incision, you dissect down through the subcutaneous tissue, identify the fascia of the gas truck, and then the PEZ, which comes in um, sort of reverse because uh, it, it seems a little odd as you're lying prone. And then essentially you just lift off the entire medial head of the gas truck off the uh, posterior aspect of the tibia. Then you can incise the popliteus muscle and clear out the fracture. These are some clinical pictures from this case uh, where the patient is in a prone position. Retractor placement is incredibly important in this approach. I use a, what's called a Norfolk retractor, which you can see with a red dot on it, and just a blunt home and to go over to the lateral side. And, and with that, you usually get adequate visualization. In case you are unable to do that, you can dissect um, in the um, uh, uh, more proximally and, in fact, release some of the medial head of the gas truck. That usually requires that you uh, incise um, along the crease to the lateral side and sometimes even further up. And that sometimes can help to, to gain you uh, more access more posterior laterally. This is this long term follow up. So again, the, the most important uh, thing is when you look at um, axial CT cuts to really make sure that um, you scrutinize for any um, posterior lateral in, in, in addition to sometimes posterior medial fracture components. These are sort of shear fractures that really are important to remember that um, in that case, I think going posterior will help you to uh, reduce the fracture and to fix the fracture appropriately. Again, this is sort of a, a study that um, highlights this point of the posterior medium, posterior lateral fracture fragment. 
Uh, in general, this is just a small paper, a small case series um, that um, looked at uh, outcomes of posterior tibial plateau f- fracture fixation. In general, they do quite okay. Uh, in in my hands, I do like to place them in a, a knee mobilizer for two weeks because uh, the scarring and the posterior aspect of the knee can make it difficult for patients to get full extension. So I keep them uh, for um, two weeks, uh, uh, sort of either locked in extension or just in a knee mobilizer to to um, allow them to really regain that uh, full extension back. And um, as not surprising, this is another study that came out of my institution that uh, looked at this, and, and uh, there is no question that um, the there is a correlation between the articular reduction and the functional outcome scores. With that, I'd like to conclude and hand it back over to the moderators. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Arvind. That was uh, very precise and good. Uh, We don't have uh, questions and answers for these first two talks, but if there are any burning questions, we can take them later. We now go on to the next session, which is on distal femur fractures, and I invite uh, Greg to give his talk on intraarticular distal femur fractures. Sorry, uh, after each lecture, there's going to be five minutes for question and answers, so please send in your questions, and we will try to Take them at the end of the talk. Thank you. Greg. Very good. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to speak about distal femur fractures now for a few minutes. <clears throat> These are some uh, rather complex fractures, and uh, but they're fun to fix. And um, unfortunately, we see tons of them. And uh, uh, they can be rather disabling, as you know. So our treatment goals for distal femur fractures are anatomic reduction of the articular fragments, restoration of axial alignment of the limb, which includes length, alignment, and rotation. We want to have stable enough fixation that we can start early motion for the knee, and we want to prevent them from collapsing into varus. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. So things for you to remember. So first of all, there is a unique geometry and anatomy of the distal femur that we need to respect and restore. Our fixation strategy is based on the type of fracture pattern, whether it's an A, B, or C type. Uh, And I'll go through each of those briefly, including the A types, even though this is about articular fractures. We want to get an anatomic articular reduction, correct our axial alignment, And then we want to understand our implants before we use them. So it's very important to know what implants you're using. So remember, the femur is always trying to go into varus. That's based on its anatomy. It wants to fall into varus. So our job is to prevent it from doing so. And we can do that either with implants or with a combination of implants and the bone itself, especially in the setting of minimal comminution. So remember the distal femur geometry, the mechanical axis of the leg falls through the center of the knee. uh, And there's about five to nine degrees of valgus in the distal femur, okay? But noting that the mechanical axis falls medial to the shaft of the femur means that despite the distal femoral valgus, the femur is going to want to fall into varus if it fails. Also remember the distal femur is a trapezoid if looked at end on there is about a 10 degree internal rotation of the lateral cortex. So when you are ready to apply your implants, these are designed, the the special shape is designed to accommodate this 10 degree internal rotation. So think about internally rotating your plate when you apply it to the distal femur. Also notice that the shaft is above the junction of the anterior and middle third of the femoral condyles. So you can see on the left, there is a, there's a nail that comes down and notice it comes pretty anterior in the distal femur. So if you want to align a plate, like a blade plate with the rest of the femur, it needs to be positioned anteriorly, which you can see with the shaded box labeled W in the right-hand image. If you're too posterior, then not only will the distal femur not align properly with the shaft as you see here on the lateral view, but you also get what's called a golf club or a hockey stick type of deformity. And what happens is is the plate will drive the distal femur 
medially and you'll get a deformity like this every time. So make sure your plate's not too posterior. And this is what it can look like when that happens. Hopefully you won't have this. And then remember, as we're reducing the fractures, we have lots of deforming forces that we need to work against, including the quadriceps anteriorly, <clears throat> the adductor muscles medially, and the gastrocnemius, which is the real thing that we have to work against, which is always pulling the distal femur into the deformity that you see here. So we talked about surgical approaches already, lots of different ways to get to where we need to go. And then remember the fracture pattern will ultimately determine direct versus indirect reduction techniques, especially if there's lots of comminution. Uh, if there is articular involvement, then we need to get a direct reduction. Absolute versus relative stability is also based on the fact fracture pattern. Uh, the type of dissection and approach that you'll use is based on your fracture pattern and, of course, implant choice as well. So you need to understand the injury. And the way to do this is to make sure you have appropriate x-rays and CT scans when you can get them. Remember that up to 40% of distal femur fractures have coronal plane fractures or posterior condylar fractures. These are most precisely diagnosed with CT scan. So these should be planned surgeries. These are not things where you just show up and just start going. You need to understand the injury before you start. So let's briefly talk about the different types of fractures with some cases. These are two patients. One was in a car crash at the top and one was a gunshot wound at the bottom. You can see two different types of extra articular distal femur fractures. They can be simple metaphyseal or comminuted. So immediately you should be thinking, well, the simple metaphyseal fracture may be able to be reduced directly, maybe some lag screws placed and then neutralized with a plate whereas the bottom set of fractures might be amenable to bridge plating because with all the degree of comminution, it's going to be very difficult to get a perfect anatomical reduction of every fragment. And so you can see here using soft tissue sparing techniques, using strategically placed clamps on the top, we can achieve a direct reduction, uh, whereas on the bottom, we're mostly looking to restore alignment Okay, and we can get everything aligned through use of various things, including femoral distractor or table traction, or just using an assistant to help, along with bumps placed in appropriate position. And then you can see uh, absolute stability with a neutralization plate and lag screws at the top, and then a bridge plating construct at the bottom. What about for B-type fractures? <clears throat> Well, this is a patient who was involved in a car crash. <clears throat> and if you look very carefully, you'll see that there seems to be just a little bit of irregularity of the lateral condyle. Well, this is very important to identify because even though that doesn't look too bad, if you get some extra imaging, you can see clearly that that is a huge lateral condylar fragment and it's also articular. You can see on the lateral view on the right that there's articular involvement. Obviously, we would use a CT scan for full delineation of this injury. This is a B-type fracture. It's just the lateral condyle in this case. Uh, and in this case, the goal is to do some type of buttress if you can. So if it's a purely articular fracture, you may not be able to do that, uh, but independent screws and then a buttress plate if necessary. And if you're able, and you can see how this was done <clears throat> using a primarily medial approach here. Okay, so multiple lag screws. Uh, many of these are buried or immediately on the articular margin, and then a plate placed in buttress fashion to avoid the articular surface. What about C-type fractures? These are the ones that are, uh, have lots of articular involvement. So this is a patient who was involved in a car crash, is about 35 years old. And you can see that there's long extension into the diaphysis for this fracture. You can also see if you look carefully, especially on the anteroposterior image, you can see the articular split, maybe with a tiny bit of comminution. <clears throat> and so this was fixed uh, using an open approach through, the, through an anterolateral exposure. We were able to get into the joint. We were able to see the articular surface. We reduced it, placed lag screws, and then applied a neutralization plate after clamping along the diaphysis. You can see that here multiple clamps applied. This obviously wouldn't happen for a highly comminuted fracture. I'm not sure that a femoral distractor is needed in this case where we have a perfect, or excuse me, an articulated tensioning device is needed, 
for when you have a perfect reduction as you see here. But you can see the reduction and this would be what it looks like intraoperatively where you don't have to make a huge incision to apply a large plate. And this is what the patient looked like when they were done. So let's talk about articular reduction briefly in the last minute or so. If you have comminuted fractures, you want to consider reducing the medial condyle fracture first. If you can see this, you can do it through a separate medial incision, but sometimes you can get to it through your lateral incision. You see you need to move the patella out of the way, which you can do with Holman retractors. Um, and then you have to be careful placing this clamp, but this is possible to do through your lateral or anterolateral exposure or even an anterior exposure. Um, just you're in front of the cruciate ligaments. You may need to remove the ligamentum that is in the way, uh, but you leave the ligaments alone. For the lateral condyle, also known as a Hoffa fragment, uh, you can apply clamps as you see here. And then the intercondylar split. And this is where you have to be really careful because most often you reduce the intercondylar split with a clamp like this, but you can see that it gaps the posterior aspect of the fracture. You need to be aware that this is going to happen and work against it. And one way to do that is to apply another clamp to an accessory medial incision uh, that you can see here. With the clamp applied a little bit more posteriorly, it reduces the fracture nicely. And then remember, it's all about length, alignment, and rotation. You need to know your implants. So when you put your screws in, independent lag screws, they're not going to get in the way of the particular plate that you're using. And then remember, where you put your plate is going to drive your alignment. And in fact, if you put your plate on properly, it can help actually drive your reduction. So for example, here's an articular fracture of a patient with a prior anterior cruciate ligament injury. And an appropriately placed plate can actually drive the distal femur into position. But if you place it incorrectly, you'll get the golf club problem. And this is what this patient looked like at the end. So remember, unique geometry and anatomy for the distal femur, fixation strategies based on the fracture pattern. You want to get an anatomical reduction of the articular surface and then get your axial alignment either directly or indirectly. And then always understand your implant so you make sure you put it in the, same, in the correct place so that you don't end up causing a deformity. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Greg. Uh so we'll take some questions on this talk and uh, well, I'll start the ball rolling with, uh, Greg, you didn't talk about double plating and there's been a lot of literature and controversy over this uh, in the recent uh, literature. And uh, when do you decide to put a second plate? Because personally in my practice, I use it really rarely and very uh, uh, specifically for certain type of fractures, but uh, there's been a lot of things saying, oh, you must use a double plate or some medial fixation. And when do you think it's really necessary? Yeah, so, so I would suggest that anybody who says that you must use a double plate is wrong. Um, so, however, I think that that double plating is a very powerful tool. Um, and uh, I, I would encourage, this will be a plug for the Orthopedic Trauma Association meeting. Um, please do attend uh, because there will be some presentations on dual plating or nail and plate combinations used for distal femur fractures. So please do uh, try to attend the Orthopedic Trauma Association meeting if you can, either virtually or in person. We would love to see you in the United States if you are able to travel in October to Dallas. So um, I use dual plating when I have a large amount of comminution in the metaphysis, there is no question that we have survived many years with just lateral plates. Um, the truth of the matter is that blade plates are probably more stable than the current locking plate designs. Okay, so, so I wonder if some of the problems that we've seen with uh, failure in varus with single plates are, prob are potentially more related to the use of the newer plates, which are easier to use than blade plates, as opposed to the use of blade plates uh, historically. But that being said, it's also entirely possible that we just didn't have good follow-up many, many years ago with blade plates. So we don't know what happened to some of these patients. So I use medial plates fairly routinely 
Uh, the approach to the medial distal femur makes people very nervous because they're worried about the blood vessels. But the truth of the matter is, is that we know the anatomy. If you're going to be going over there, you know the anatomy, you know what you need to avoid. And it's a very simple dissection. And usually all I will do is I'll use a, I'll use a small fragment plate uh, to go on that side just to provide medial support. Um, but again, the most important thing is to achieve the correct reduction. And then if I feel that I'm missing a lot of bone medially because it's comminuted, that's when I'll put the medial plate on. And I do it quite routinely. And it uh, takes a little bit of extra time, but it makes us all feel better. Uh, any of the other faculty want to chime in on that? Because... I, I can't agree more with Greg. I, I think the 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 do not hesitate to go medial if you think you need to. And in general, in my my practice, I usually go medial if the if there's a large metaphysical component that's that's ranging between six to ten centimeters, and and I I just do not trust my laterally based locked implant. But then, as Greg also mentioned, you can, if you anticipate that, you can probably go to a blade plate um, just from the get-go if you're facile with that. One brief note in terms of implants, um, um, we, or I do use a lot of the synthesis implants because there's no specific implant for the medial side. Uh, so you can use a contralateral flipped upside down proximal tibia plate to apply to the medial uh, distal femur. Or sometimes if, if um, uh, you can also just use an LCDC plate um, and then stick it into the canal and try to shoot over from the lateral side to through the, the other um, screw holes. So you can do that too as a sort of a strut on the medial side. Both options are reasonable. Yes, and, and Arvin made a very nice point about an intramedullary plate. Um, and that's a technique that was written many years ago by uh, Jeff Matt. Yeah. Um, and it's a very powerful technique. It sometimes uh, <clears throat> takes a little bit of extra effort and finesse to get it done properly, um, but it works very, very nicely. And then it's the possibility of medial, uh, medial implant prominence. But if you position your plates appropriately on the medial side of the femur, uh, I think you'll probably be okay. I usually just use uh, an LCDC plate so uh, a standard plate, and then I contour it. But also uh, people have used proximal humerus plates. That's an off-label use um, of the plate because it's designed to be put on the proximal humerus and not the femur, but, it's, but it does fit there with very slight modifications. How are we doing for time? I think we are just ready to start your talk, John. So... Okay. Uh, so our next talk is going to be by uh, by our co-chairman, uh, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, and he'll be talking about malunions of the distal femur. Yeah, so this is an area which is not often covered uh, very much in uh, trauma meetings, and um, uh, it's interesting that we see a lot more of these today, especially with the minimally invasive techniques being done. Uh, basically, no real conflict of interest as far as this presentation is concerned. Uh, I will go straight uh, to a case that we dealt with some years ago, which was uh, a 60-year-old man who had a distal femur fracture, which was treated by, with uh, DCS many years ago. And um, this plate was removed after three years, but he came to us 12 years after that original fixation complaining of increasing pain and difficulty in walking. And those were his x-rays. And uh, you can see the marked virus on the left side, and you can see the virus thrust when he's walking. Okay, so you need to do your long leg films whenever you're analyzing these uh, distal femur malunions. And then you would, for intra-articular malunions, of course, you would need a CT scan. But here it was mostly an extra-articular problem. So you do your... Uh, mechanical axis uh, measurements and you can see in this that although it's a malunion of the femur the problem is not just in the femur uh, of course the femur has significant uh, virus as you can see from the mechanical lat lateral distal femur angle but he also has virus of the proximal tibia as you can see in the medial proximal tibial angle so you 
to deal with this, you need to deal with both the deformities so that you get a good correction. So that is what we did. We did a closing wedge lateral uh, distal femur osteotomy uh, with a standard approach. And we also did a high tibial osteotomy using uh, the techniques that have been described in the Tomofix uh, method of doing that, which is, uh, again, using angle-stable implants to fix your osteotomies. No bone graft, even though you have quite a big correction on both sides. So this is the femur, which is a closing wedge. And this was the tibia, which is an opening wedge osteotomy. Okay, so, and this is him post-op. You can see a good correction of the overall alignment, uh, looking at both uh, the AP and lateral x-rays. Uh, this is him at six months follow-up. And it's interesting, if you look at the x-rays, how his uh, hip, which was uh, knee, which was much worse earlier, looks a lot better than his opposite knee, which uh, is now going into a virus. And this is him again at three years, six months uh, post-op. You can see he's got virus thrust on the opposite side. And I've suggested an osteotomy to him on that side. But with this COVID outbreak, he's waiting for this to get over before he comes in for surgery for the opposite side. But you can see how the knee has held out so much better on the left side because the alignment has been corrected adequately. Uh, again, as I mentioned, not so much in the literature for post-traumatic malunions. Here are a couple of papers, one by Michael Miranda from the US and the other one is from Italy, which it looks at the challenges of dealing with non-unions and malunions in distal femur surgical revision. The other area which we see quite a lot of are these intra-articular malunions. And again, this is an area where we don't have too much on the literature. And this is an interesting case. This was a young girl. She was about 16 or 17 when she came to us and had an injury about nine months earlier, uh, which was treated in a cast, uh, 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 sorry, some years ago, two years ago. And he was treated. she was treated in a cast for six weeks. And she developed a full flexion, okay? but she was unable to extend her knee properly, okay? So, and if you look at the CT scan, you can see this step off here. So this was a off a fracture, which was probably not uh, recognized adequately. And she was treated uh, conservatively. And although she had full flexion, as you will see, she had this fixed flexion deformity, which you could not correct even passively. So this is on the table. You can see that she's got full flexion, but even under anesthesia, she's got this fixed flexion deformity of the knee. And this was almost two years down the line. So it was really a difficult decision to do something because of the full flexion that she had. And we were worried that if she loses flexion, uh, we would uh, be unhappy about that and she would be unhappy about that. But interestingly, when how, whatever you see on the CT, when you actually look inside the knee, the step off is really much more severe than it looked on the X-rays or the CT. You can see this big step off. This is the posterior fragment. This is the anterior part of the condyle. And so we did an osteotomy through the fracture line, more or less. Uh, we tried to separate out. The, so on the image, that's how we did the osteotomy. We took out a wedge of tissue, which was a combination of callus and fibrous tissue here. And uh, then we had to get this back to the original place. And this was not easy because of the delay. So we had to use a, a combination of clamps to pull it and uh, 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 another clamp to try and uh, uh, clamp it together, uh, something to lever it. We was Because we were trying to maintain the soft tissue attachment on this posterior fragment. But uh, gradually, with some time spent, we were able to get it reduced adequately, as you can see here now. Uh, we fixed it with these three screws that were countersunk and in compression by overdrilling the proximal area. I prefer these fully threaded screws with overdrilling to the partially threaded screws because I find they seem to hold better, but that's a personal choice. And uh, this is her at about nine months post-op, and this is her at four years, six months follow-up. You can see how uh, nicely she's corrected up. Uh, she's got married and has a child now. And uh, so we were lucky in this one. We managed to get a good result. But uh, in a situation like this, where the function preoperatively is reasonably good, the decision-making can be more difficult. Again, uh, the, the literature is mainly 
those of case reports. Here's one uh, from Japan on correction of an uh, uh, osteotomy for a malunited hoffa. There have been a few others using image uh, sort of navigation, and one even using a navigation for a total knee replacement for a malunited distal femur fracture. Uh, here again, you can have uh, intra uh, articular malunions in older patients. And here again, the decision is do you leave it uh, till things get bad enough and do a total knee replacement, or you try and do something for it? So you can see this is a, a medial a condyle fracture, which is displaced. You can see the step off here. And she had a fixed flexion deformity of about uh, 20 degrees and a range of motion till about 80 degrees. So here, we have to again go through the previous fracture line, get it reduced. We use this postromedial buttress, a T-plate. This is the regular uh, T-plate and then a couple of leg screws across the reduced fracture. This is about four months post-op and this is about a year and three months post-op when she came recently. You can see she is reasonably well aligned, same as the opposite side. And she's got... Uh, full extension and about 100 degrees of flexion at this stage. So doing reasonably well uh, in this situation. So again, uh, again, a case report of a malunion of the medial femoral condyle with a uh, osteotomy. Uh, we also get these, uh, this is an unusual case who presented to us about four and a half months after injury. Uh, you can see the grossly displaced of element to the fracture on the lateral side. Uh, those were the CT scans. And this patient, for some reason, had been neglected and treated conservatively. I think initially he went to a bone setter and he came to us at uh, four and a half months with almost no motion in the knee. And this is, again, a difficult situation. You need to go in, uh, you need to mobilize the fragments. You can see there's some articular comminution as well, but you try to get it as well reduced as possible. Uh, we put in these lag screws. We actually put him on skeletal traction with CPM after this because we couldn't get uh, more uh, more rigid fixation with the plate because there was no beak to the fracture. And this is him at 10 months. Uh, luckily, he got back good motion and did very well as well. So uh, I think uh, the take-home messages, I think distal femoral malunions are not uncommon. I think uh, the literature is really not so uh, uh, abundant about it. Uh, ideally, you want to do the osteotomy at the site of deformity, but you need to really assess the malunion adequately in terms of exactly where the site is and decide your osteotomies accordingly. I think the results have definitely improved with better techniques and there's been a lot of newer sort of techniques involved, especially with the use of the uh, angle stable implants. But you have to choose your indications carefully and then uh, be able to deliver uh, adequate correction of the problem to get good results. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was uh, excellent clinical material and very well done. Uh, so the whole question, I guess, in these uh, malunions, extra-articular malunions, when do you decide that you are going to do a, a knee replacement as a primary procedure and what are your criteria for doing osteotomy? I mean, uh, how do you decide this? The extra mal extra articular malunions is pretty easy. So I would try to correct the deformity rather than do a, a total knee replacement. I think for the intra articular ones, it's a little more difficult, and it would depend on the duration. Uh, are there already arthritic changes in the joint, and how bad they are, and uh, also on the age of the patient. So. So the last one, which was a slightly older patient, but we thought we'll give it a try. And it's a discussion you have with the patient. Okay, so I think in that older patient, maybe someone else might decide to wait and when things get bad enough, do a total knee replacement. But I felt that we could still get that malunion reduced and get a decent correction. I think uh, for extra-articular malunions, essentially as long as the knee hasn't become arthritic beyond a stage where you feel that an osteotomy is not going to work. So, yeah. And very often, I think the uh, X-ray picture is a little misleading. You might see some medial compartmental arthritis, but once you unload the knee by realigning the lens, they improve, yeah. They improve. What's so, the experience of the other uh, faculty, Dean Dalen and others? You must be doing similar cases. Uh, 
No, we we also do the osteotomies and then corrections of the intraarticular uh, thing. But sometimes we also had problems with fitness, like uh, especially the one that hofas we were correcting. We ended yeah. up having a lot of uh, stiffness. So I think hofas is something. Hofas small union is something is difficult to correct, I suppose. So yeah. So I think with hofas you have to be careful. Uh, what we do for them is at about six to eight weeks. If they're not getting motion, we do an uh, arthroscopic arthrolysis. Okay, so that would uh, greatly increase your chances of getting good motion. Okay, so I think uh, it's important to do that in good time because if you wait too long, then it becomes more difficult. So, uh, John, there's a question from Dr. Sanjay Dhawan. Uh, yeah. In two of the cases, you know, the intraarticular uh, osteotomies which you did. You did only screw fixation, so he is wondering about the specific reason for not using a buttress plate. You partly answered this, but maybe we can tell them once again. Yeah, so basically, see, the, uh, the ideal position to buttress them is at the beak. Okay, so if they don't have a beak, it becomes difficult to buttress it. Okay, if you put just a lateral plate, it really isn't going to work as a buttress because the beak, if it's anywhere, it's posterior. And so, if the if you saw the case where was a slightly larger fragment with the beak going into the metaphysis. We buttressed it posterior medially, uh, but these ones which are intra entirely intraarticular, it becomes difficult to actually buttress it. You may put a lateral plate with a screw anterior and posterior, but if you get really good compression across, and the first one was a young, these were both young patients, so I, I was able to get really nice compression with these three screws, which I felt was adequate fixation. Yeah. But yes, I did. you can buttress it. Definitely, buttressing makes a difference. I did notice that the 16-year-old girl whom you showed, there was a through cast X-ray, which you yeah. So initially, just immediate post-op, but then we mobilized her quite early after that. It was just a slab, actually. So we do often keep them in a slab for a couple of days. Uh, So, coming from the OTA faculty on their experiences, Greg? I, I think um, um, sometimes it becomes, uh, I mean, beautiful cases that you showed, uh, really amazing work. I, I think um, sometimes with the extra articular uh, malunions, it is a little bit difficult intraoperatively to understand whether you've corrected appropriately or not. And um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on how you how you assess that, and then I can, um, I guess, briefly uh, touch on what I use. We always do the cable uh, test on, on intraoperatively. So we use the Bowie wire from the center of the hip to the center of ankle and have it passing through the center of the knee. Uh, but I think your preoperative assessment is really important as well. So I think this getting these angles uh, sort of in your mind before you start is important so you know where you're correcting them and how much correction you need. And of course, we look at it as well. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of the things that, that I'm usually doing for if I have to do a deformity correction is, uh, number one, I mean, I usually just make sure I have images of the contralateral side. I try to get yeah. those beforehand and usually plain films. I'm not talking about CRM images. But the other thing uh, that I found helpful is that since the C-arm is difficult to assess the overall alignment because it's a very, very restricted field, um, I will get intraoperative plane films of the femur as well and review those. So, um, you know, those are just some things that, that I found helpful because um, sometimes it can be difficult uh, to... And then I, I always really make sure that I get my rotation correct as well. And, and I'll do that. Uh, I usually just use a C-arm technique where I look at the lesser trochanteric profile uh, and I compare it to a direct AP, anteroposterior image of the knee. So I have the patella specifically positioned so that the inferior pole overlaps the top of the, the very top of the notch or the trochlea on the distal femur. And I make sure that those are the same on both sides. So that's, those are some little we tricks. Also use navigation actually. So to look at the alignment and we've actually tried it. The thing is when you're doing high tibial osteotomies, 
most of these navigation need you to open the joint, which we don't do when we are just doing a straightforward HDO. But for these uh, patients where we have to open the joint, we can actually uh, uh, maybe even try to do uh, intraoperative uh, navigation to check the alignments as well. Yeah, I, I, I essentially use the same techniques with the bovi cord. You just have to be careful to uh, avoid parallax because it will um, yeah. uh, um, make sure yeah. you, you're, you have to be very careful. And also um, to ensure that your distal bovi cord is in the in the center of both of the malleoli, not actually of the distal tibia, because yeah. otherwise you induce uh, a malalignment. And I usually check the rotation of the contralateral side before I prep, I usually use all possibilities to minimize the, the risk of malrotation or malalignment because that is <laughs> it's very easy to do. A quick note, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, um, for proximal tibia or distal femur intraarticular malunions, I have started to use the intraoperative CT scans because I, I do we do have the ability and, and I do think that it's sometimes hard to really understand on a 2D X-ray the ad, uh, adequate um, reduction, if especially if it's more complex, have have any of you had the chance to try that or anybody any experience? So we don't have access to intraoperative CT, but we certainly. So it's important to study your CT. We do a lot of intraarticular malunions for the proximal tibia, so we have actually a whole series of cases which we hope to be reporting soon. But uh, so. Uh, we don't have intraoperative CT, unfortunately. So I yeah, I'm sure you have much more experience than actually we do. We we see it very rarely. We we see it very rarely, and that's why I think, I I, I you know because the technology we do have the technology and 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 I have changed my management intraoperatively <laughs> after getting a, a CT. We've had one posterior medial fragment that was um, had a large gap about a you know half a centimeter and it was a little bit tricky to see because you can't really see the articular reduction properly so that was helpful for that okay i think uh, we are running out of time now so interesting discussion so we go on to the next talk which we have dr din Allen from quimbuto is going to talk about distal femur gaps how you deal with them so over to you didi Thank you, John. So <clears throat> we do get to see a lot of uh, distal femur bone loss purely because we do treat a lot of open injuries. So we all know that any critical bone defect is something like greater than two centimeter of gap, or if the circumference is more than 50%, you consider it as a critical bone defect. I said that we uh, we do a lot of uh, open injuries and you get to see patients either they lose their fragment in the during the accident or at the time of debridement you need to take out a lot of bone fragments and that is why they end up with bone gap. Last uh, year like during the pandemic year of 2020 we saw 479 patients of them distal femur was 53 fracture open injuries among them, 16 were having a bone loss. That means 30% of them had a bone loss. So this bone loss is managing them is a major challenge. It requires multiple treatment options and methods. It, though there is uh, multiple options, but there is no comparative evidence. There is no good series about comparative evidence. We also know that a distal femur bone loss can end up having a spontaneous regeneration and this is one of the patients who developed a spontaneous regeneration. We just went ahead to fix it at the end and then he gets a good function. On the contrary, sometimes they also can end up with secondary amputation. If you think of salvage, it can also end up with secondary amputation. Sometimes amputation is extremely like it's a difficult decision to make. There is little consensus. Nerve injury and soft tissue injury are important prognostic indicator. So in the beginning, to convince them for an amputation sometimes is extremely difficult. However, when you plan for a reconstruction, various treatments are there. See, for example, it's, you can also manage with bone grafts or a fibular strut graft or even complete uh, uh, autografts and allografts combination. And then you can also think of a limb, limb reconstruction system where you can do a bone transport procedure. The reamer irrigator aspirator technique for bone graft and masculine technique are also being described. However, 
the limb reconstruction system is something that is commonly used. You can also do a shortening of the limb with a good fixation. And then later on, you do a transport and then finally ends up having a good result. This is one of the way by which you can do a good reconstruction. But the shortening when you are doing in the distal femur, it cannot be more than four centimeter. If you do it, then because of the excessive soft tissue bulk, you will not be able to shorten it or get the closure done. So you have to be very careful in doing the shortening. So for example, to reduce the frame time, you, you need to think of a lot of various options like you have to get the global reconstruction earlier. You can do a double segment transport, pre-grafting or transport over a reamed, unreamed nail. All those things you can have a, as a sort of a techniques by which you can re reduce the frame time. However, there is also other methods by which you can think of doing the bone loss management. See, like suppose if you think there is a fragments all around and then periosteum seems to be in continuity, you just get a fixation done with the bone graft, it can still go on to heal. But here in this patient, you can see that the uh, screws broke and then we just have to go back in again and then do the fixation. The same plate, it went on to heal well with a good result. Suppose when there is periosteum also in, that is the fragments are there in place and then it, you see it, it seems like periosteum is in continuity. You can also get the fibula strut graft in addition, bone graft with a fixation. Again, this also will go on to have a good function. And also like these complex fractures, so when there is a circumferential bone loss. So in these instances, when you think there is extensive crushing or if there is some amount of contamination, then you need to do them in stages. And then in those stages that you are doing, initially you can do an articular reconstruction. In the beginning itself, you can do articular reconstruction. And later you do a secondary reconstruction. Here what we have done is taken the allograft, so shaped it, and then once we shape it in position, and then the intramedullary area of the allograft must be reamed, and then you can put autograft into that, and then once you position it very well, and then you can also get it fixed well, and this is the fixation that you get. And uh, once you do that, this is at four months, you can see a little bit of callus is formed all over. And then at 14 months, it gets nicely incorporated. So this is the uh, purely an autograph with an allograft combination, and it gives you a good function, good result. And also like this, as I said, the staged reconstruction, you, need, you have to be ca cautious, especially when you are doing an extensive crushing of soft tissue or severe contamination, always do in stages. Otherwise, you can do a global reconstruction as early as possible. However, if you think there is a vascularized fibula versus bone transport uh, is being uh, often discussed, and they also said that it is the bone transport is slightly better than vascularized fibula because when you do a vascularized fibula, you need to protect the limb for a very long time. So that is why they said the transport is better. What we do is because we also have an allograft combination, we incorporate it. So the Capena technique was described for a tumor reconstruction surgeries. So we have modified it and then put it for the uh, all these uh, trauma bone gaps, distal, uh, distal femur bone gaps. And then you can see with our plastic colleagues, we do both of them together. And then once it is done, so you just shove in the microvascular fibula inside the autograft and then position it and then fix it well and then it will go on to heal. So we have we have also published it in a, a trauma uh, series. So trauma case reports, we have published it. And also we have given it in the in plastic surgery department, uh, this thing, Indian Journal of Plastic Surgery. We have published it as modified Capanna technique with series of 19 patients. And then, so in what we have learned over the period of time is like, both bone transport and this method of uh, technique gives good results. Only thing is the limb reconstruction system, we often use it whenever there is more crushing, also when there is a contamination is more. Whereas when it is just an extruded fragments or when the bone, when the wound is smaller, then we tend to go ahead and do a global reconstruction with the Kapana technique. Bone gap management is challenging and difficult. Continuing monitoring is needed. Actually, you need to speak to the patients repeatedly because 
that any time it can go in for a secondary amputation that needs to be told to them but if it is managed very well it is extremely satisfying so these are the methods by which you can also manage and it is really a pleasure to manage them well and then get a good result thank you thanks a lot uh, deep dhan that was excellent and i think this uh, modified kapana's technique really seems an excellent way to deal with some of these bone gaps uh, i think the problem is a lot of a uh, lot of people don't have access to allograft uh, so that becomes an issue so maybe for them uh, transport is probably a better option uh, any uh, so there are questions in the chat box which are coming in late so uh th there was uh, one from uh so there i haven't yet seen any questions on this particular talk but uh if any of the faculty have anything to add here we'd be happy to entertain that so i i i i just have a quick question for dr ddi uh first off incredible cases incredible presentation wonderful cases and outcomes really remarkable I think that's the reason why we we uh, repeatedly send residents over to your hospital to learn from your experience it's really a wonderful. Um a question two questions I have for you one is um when do you decide to take out um large bone fragments uh, there's been some new evidence that suggests that you can actually keep even if they're denuded you can keep some of the bone fragments. Um that's one question and the second question I have for you is when do you decide or do you use at all the mescaline technique no remember remember first question is like when do we remove the bone fragments suppose as as normally described we always do the tuck test and if there is a good soft tissue that is there we don't remove it but if it is independent and then if it is any patient who has got contamination suppose if somebody has got severe contamination we almost all of them we remove the soft tissue yeah, yeah. so if it is not contaminated there is no point if even if there is small number a small soft tissue attachment a very feeble attachment we tend to keep it it is the contamination that will decide whether you to remove it completely or not coming to the next question that you asked is uh, mascular some of the times when there is a small bone gap that is there we tend to put a, bo a bone cement and then keep it often it heals with bone cement itself we don't try to remove it and then go in for a bone graft at second but if there is a medial void if there is a medial side if there is a void and then you keep a bone cement then at those times we have removed it and used as a used bone graft later but we don't specifically call it as a masculine technique as such it is sometimes it is not that we don't do that in 4 to 6 weeks say specific time it takes little while longer than what is described so we yeah. may not be able to classify it as masculine technique so great so we we do use the masculine technique often for some of these large bone gaps uh, mm -hmm. where we sometimes actually use the plate as our initial fixation and then use a uh, big uh, chunk of cement with antibiotics and then at about 6 weeks later we go in and replace it with bone graft the only problem is
we do next is the question that any non union that you are going to assess is going up based to be on contact alignment and stability and biology these are the ways by which you are going to analyze any distal femur that you have you must always get a good medial contact and the alignment must be centered so you hip knee and uh, ankle alignment must be perfectly be centered and stability of course you have to give an adequate stability and then biology that is the bone graft you need to add it so based on this concepts we are going to have the presentation and what we did was we you can see that we got it positioned well and then you can see the gap between the fem that is the femur and then the plate we got it little medialized here the shaft got medialized but also we added a medial fibular strut graft when we add a me medial fibular strut graft along with uh, uh, autografts then you can see it this is at 6 weeks and then this is at 4 months so it has gone on to heal well and then it is at 1 year follow up and they do a very good result what i did in this case is like is not only achieving a medial contact but also in all these non unions we use muller's compression device you have to give contact compression stability and the stimulus and then get the perfect alignment if you get that then definitely all of them will go on to heal well this another patient you can see that though it's a very distally placed fracture it is purely because of the failure of this fixation what we did was like the same thing like we did again went back to do the medial strut graft got the shaft medialized and got it centered and then you can see that when we have it centered nicely and when you put it your alignment you can see that it is completely in good alignment so it is the key the alignment is the key and then get a medial contact perfectly aligned and then you have it positioned like this with a good stability it will go on to heal well and then like this is the same point so if you are not getting that medial contact right it always results in medial void whenever there is a medial void it is it is going to fail and that again the same the Uh, procedure that we did it is the medial strut graft and then the st stabilization with the uh, centralization of the shaft and also many times when there is a rotation suppose if you fix your distal femur and proximal femur in rotation again you see it ends up with non union in this situations are also it is a question of loss of the surface area of contact and also like it alignment will change completely and then it will A result in non union and then we got it nicely reduced you can see that compared to what it was before now you see it is in good shape you can see that between the femur and then the plate there is a gap that we got it so that we get the medial co cortex aligned well and then the strut graft here you see because the strut graft the strut graft we have placed it more on the posterior as well as medial side and that's why you get the uh see here it is on the posterior side and also on the medial side that we get and then once we get it going then it has a good result gets goes on to heal well so what is important is we need to have a good medial column continuity and then the contact and then alignment must be good and then once you get it then stability and biology is added and then the contact that we also must have a compression so that is muller's compression device you must use to get get all these parameters correct so we have published also this is in the injury journal which we published our 22 cases managed with the same type of method and then like what we also did was we studied on that medial void pattern and then when we studied the medial void pattern what we found it is if it is void is less than 2 cm we can get away with the medial strut graft whereas when it is more than when the medial medial side gap is more we always try to do a medial plating so that is what we thought is the right way of doing and then we with the, the that is what we said whenever it is a medial void less than 2 cm is always good to use a strut whereas more it is a plate is better option and this also we got it published in archives of orthopedics and trauma surgery and we also made a algorithm on that so that we said that if it is a good stable fixation and good alignment only bone grafting would be sufficient in those uh, patients whereas on the contrary 
if there is a patient who is more than 65 years or has inadequate bone stock, you will have to think of an arthroplasty as well in these patients. Whereas between them, if it is a good alignment and then the void is less as we have spoken already, whereas the void is less than 2 cm, it's structural medial metaphyseal strut. Whereas if it is more than 2 cm, it is a medial plating that will be required. So that is what we made it in this and then we wrote it up also. Thank you very much. Yeah, really that was absolutely fantastic. I think uh, the last slide uh, tells the entire story. So in fact, we were going to ask you about when to use medial plate and you answered the question. So uh, it's very hard to, <laughs> to know what you've not covered in this and what to ask you. Um, I, I have a quick question, if I may. Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> so, so I think that was, again, wonderful. Um, one of the um, tricky aspects of um, the surgeries that you um, showed that you seem to make look easiest is um, getting the fibular allograft in the, into its correct position because oftentimes the distal segment in the distal femur is, is um, dense bone and also the proximal the, in the canal is usually easier, but to really jam it into the distal segment can be a little bit tricky and getting in the right location. Do you have any tips and tricks for the audience to, to help them with that? What I do is uh, we take the DHS reamer. So the D triple reamer, DHS triple reamer. And then first we pass the guide over into the position where you want the fibula graft to go in. And then we once we make the hole for the triple reamer to go and then get the allograft first positioned into the distal side. And once you position it, and then what you need to do is good traction and then make a small window on the lateral cortex of your distal, that is a proximal femur, distal portion of the proximal femur on the lateral cortex, make a small window and then push the graft in, it will go into the medullary canal and then get it into it. So, the, get that, uh, release the traction, it will get into position. So, so uh, you only use manual traction, no distraction. You only use a manual traction. Manual, just assistant traction is sufficient. So, <laughs> so one thing, uh, Didi, I noticed that, uh, so we also see a lot of these non-unions, uh, but we use the fibula less frequently. But what we do try to do is to get lag screws across sometimes. Wherever it's possible, we try to get in a lag screw to give us additional compression and contact. And uh, I think sometimes that, I feel, is the key to getting these to heal. Uh, so, uh, that's something… So we achieve compression only by Muller's compression device. Yeah, but so some of the oblique types, it's a little more difficult to use the compression device uh, adequately. So, there, so we would… Or we use the compression device all the time. I think… Uh, so I think the younger generation seem to have forgotten the compression device or they don't, it's difficult to get today. And uh, the old compression devices were actually a lot. We lost you. Complicated and more costly to use. So I think uh, we use it all the time for our non-unions. And I agree with that entirely, but we try, try to get likes. When, when, we were, when we were doing the angle blade plate earlier days, yeah, then we, we used to, use to, it all we used to put that oblique screw often. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. So, like, so I tend to still try and do it either through the plate or even independently if possible. I think that was a really uh, good point. Um, um, I think you, you both probably talk about distal femoral non-unions, but one is more of a shaft where you have a large segment of comminution and it sort of consolidates. Yeah. And then there's an oblique fracture, uh, right. oblique non-union side versus a yeah. just transverse non-union side with medial um, comminution and segmental bone loss. And and both, you know, you've, you've nicely um, touched on how to, to manage them um, uh, both uh, in a wonderful fashion. So I... I I don't have much uh, addition to that. I do use RIA. I just uh, use actually so from the contralateral okay, side yeah. and get um, some, some intro. Sure. Yeah, if you, it's an expensive way of board, getting bone graft for us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's uh, one question for Dr. Didi from Dr. Sanjay Dhawan. In distal femur fractures, if you have a Hoffa element, what is your recommendation to fix it separately only? This is actually for everybody. <laughs> 
to fix it separately only or with an anterior posterior screws i think what he wants to know is just screw fixation or plate fixation as well so is this a independent offer or a combination a combination with the distal femur fracture a combination with the distal femur fracture okay no when it is in combination first you get the hope was reduced very well to perfect alignment and then you can do the nailing or plating whatever that you want to do independent of the hope was you can definitely do it and then to decide whether to go ahead with the plate fixation or not generally it is like for example if there is a long posteriorly if there is a sliver that yeah. you need to definitely buttress it you always have to use a plate otherwise if it is a young individual screw itself is sufficient it's sufficient yeah so my my thoughts exactly uh, what what we sometimes do is use uh, screws obliquely from posterior medial or posterior lateral going antero medial or antero lateral in addition to the front to back screws so where you have enough chunk that's a big chunk this works very well so you can put a 6.5 screw here because these are extra articular so we use this compressing with a washer from the posterior medial or posterior lateral side going antero medial or antero lateral as the case may be yeah now the nails are also available with antero and opening yeah actually with locking in different directions yeah in addition to that you can use those type of nails to have a additional purchase sure and one last question before we move to the next talk dr anup has asked about the use of tens nail on the medial side to support the column in place <laughs> any no, thoughts like, on that it probably like in a combinations and then when you are having a medial void situations maybe it is some sort of uh, uh, so it might help because biomechanically we have not we don't know but there are good reports from uh, mirage group where they have said that uh, it it works well yeah the problem is how do you where is it holding in the shaft because it's it's in intramedullary like medullary yeah but what's it holding against that's the problem right so, we'll move on to the so i think we go on to the next session which is on proximal tibial fractures and again it's going to be arvin next who's going to talk about uh, the posteromedial fragment and dislocation so i think uh, one must be aware that a lot of these uh, fractures involving the medial condyle are actually dislocations of the knee and it's important to recognize them and treat them accordingly so what do you have with that thank you again so um we'll switch gears a little bit and now go to the proximal tibia and uh, my talk will be first on uh, medial tibial plateau fractures or fracture dislocations and when to go lateral So we've heard from Greg earlier today about the anatomy about the medial side and which sometimes can be a little bit more difficult than the lateral side and and what that is is it's just less common I guess to go medial and posterior medial and what why is that well there is the the MCL that uh, really blocks sort of your uh, reduction the pes is in the way the semimembranosus is in the way and then you have limited the tickler um axis in that region i always like to split the um on the coronal view the tibia into two portions the anterior and the posterior portions and then depending on that i will decide my my approach to the proximal tibia when you talk about a medial tibial plateau fractures you have a multitude of approaches uh, positions and plates uh, for the approaches you have um the direct anterior medial posterior medial in addition to a lateral and then you can decide whether to go prone um with um as we discussed earlier today particularly with there's a posterior lateral fragment in addition to that plates we have the precontoured you can use a contralateral tibial plateau plate you can use 3.5 recon plates or proximal humerus plates but do not use one third tibial plates as they're too flexible and may fail In my mind um there are from these um shats before fracture dislocations there is two types one or four types but we'll talk about two types specifically in this talk one is where the medial tibial plateau f- fracture is an isolated fracture fragment um and it's usually less energy that imparts through that area but it still um is associated with a fracture dislocation of the entire um knee 
And then we have the high energy tubular plateau fractures where you have central and lateral articular depression. And that's really, really critical to um, understand and look for because if you do not address this, as address these points, you will um, um, make the patient probably go and collapse into that defect and um, collapse into valgus. Uh, there's two other ones where um, just with axial um, uh, compression of a um, knee, you get these bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. And sometimes you get a coronal split and you should look for that too because your screws, uh, particularly if you just go from the lateral side, may not adequately um, fix those fractures. And then we've talked a little bit more about the posterior medial shear. So again, the high energy medial tibial plateau fractures are, are you, you, you can see the lateral condylar widening, you can see the central depression, and I will um, show you some cases where you can really um, understand that. There are some variable patterns uh, where sort of um, in which position the leg has been, and so there can be posterior medial or intermedial fracture um, dislocations on the medial side. And then understand that there, uh, there's a lot of soft tissue injuries, particularly on the lateral side as the knee goes into the medial, um, follows the medial tibial plateau. It rips off the lateral meniscus um, uh, and also has a high rate of ACL, MCL, and lateral collateral ligament, uh, um, ligament injuries. And in addition to that, obviously, check your pulses, make sure that they don't have a dysvascular limb, check ABIs, and, and make sure you, you, you address that uh, with a vascular surgeon as soon as possible. This is just a paper that, that uh, describes the soft tissue injuries, uh, particularly with Schatzka 4 fracture dislocations when, where they found almost up to a 46% um, soft tissue injury. So I'll start off by a case. Uh, this is a 76-year-old female. She was uh, on her way to the church and fell. So rather low energy um, um, and um, rather more geriatric or frail patient. And here you can see an AP and the lateral extra of the knee. And you can see um, how the uh, femur goes with the proximal tibia into the medial side. You can see that there is lateral and central depression, um, um, and you can see that more clearly here on the CT cut. And I'd like to um, draw your attention now to the um, lower right corner on the uh, coronal uh, CT scan. You can see that the articular reduction or the articular piece is depressed uh, about two centimeters down into the shaft almost of the tibia. And there's only a very small area on the lateral side that would support the lateral tibial, uh, the lateral femur. So it's important in my mind to address that to avoid having the patient collapse into that defect. So we did uh, what we did is we addressed it first from the media side, open it up. Um, uh, tried initially to get it from the media side, but realized it was not possible to get that. So we changed our strategy, just fixed the media um, uh, plateau with short screws in the proximal segment to allow for lateral um, uh, based uh, plate construct in the future. Um, you can still see the uh, lateral depression there. Now we made a small little anterolateral um, approach, elevated that um, a large depression, um, placed preliminary K wires, uh, applied a lateral uh, based lock plate, the lateral X-ray, and then uh, placed long screws over the over the uh, uh, articular segment, and then, then finally placed some bone substitute um, um, or whatever you'd like to use into that large defect. And this is the final outcome, and this is the um, the different fracture, the the rather. Um, um, uh, sort of just the medial fracture, but it's still a fracture dislocation that you have to be very careful about. Here you can see that m most of it is just medial. There is no central lateral depression. This one you can just all address from the medial side. You do not have to go lateral. One a nice trick is to use a large periarticular clamp, as you can see in that image, um, and, and apply it to the medial um, femoral condyle and the lateral tibial uh, plateau as it pushes over the femur back onto the lateral side and reduces the fracture. That usually helps you with a reduction of your, of your uh, medial side, and then you can just apply a posterior medial plate or wherever the apex may be. And she was back to skiing after this accident. So it's really uh, important to understand uh, wh what the fracture pattern is and plan your incisions accordingly.
I usually go medial if the um, apex is either anterior um, to the mid-coronal line or if I see an MCL injury on an MRI or if there is a need for going posterior medial. I go medial and lateral if there's a lateral joint impaction, if there's central joint impaction that I can't access from the medial side, or if there's meniscal involvement on MRI. And we briefly talked about the posterior approach and why, why to go posterior, so I won't go into that detail a little bit more. Again, there's um, uh, four types, uh, two types we particularly discussed now, um, the isolated media articular injuries, and then the high energy type four with lateral impaction. Um, I'll finish up with another case that uh, is a little bit of an odd case. Um, it's a young um, a male, um, also skiing accident. He um, um, sustained this um, hyper um, uh, extension injury. And you can see here um, the subtlety of um, posterior lateral joint depression, uh, as well as a, a posterior medial uh, fracture. So we address that from the from posterior medially. And after applying the uh, buttress plate uh, on the posterior medial side, we used the bone temp from the medial side through the fracture um, and tamped it up and placed the screw and applied some, some substitute in that um, uh, um, sort of channel. And he had a very good. And then finally, just a regular posterior medial shear just be very careful and assess for where the apex is because the apex will tell you where your implant should be. And this one was just fixed with the posterior plate. So with that, um, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you. Yeah, great, uh, uh, Arvind. And uh, while uh, the questions come in for this one, there was one from your earlier talk on uh, what your indication would be for a fibula osteotomy. So maybe you could address that while the questions come in for this session. Fibula osteotomies, um, uh, while, uh, you know, if you fasten around the knee are, are not so difficult, uh, they're not very common. And, and because the, the fracture needs to be directly posterior lateral, it should be sort of hidden behind the fibula. And that's very rare uh, as that seems to be a fairly um, con um, stiff construct in the posterior lateral corner. So usually they don't fail through the bone. If they do fail, they fail through soft tissue. Um, and so, therefore, um, uh, it's usually not necessary to go there. Um, but if, in case um, I decide to go there, that's when there is posterior lateral depression that I feel I can't go through, I can't get through from the, either the media or just the soft tissue releases on the lateral side. Yeah. So I think uh, I've, we've occasionally seen where the posterior lateral fragment is off, actually completely off and rotated, and there to get really good visualization. I think the fibula osteotomy gives you the best uh, uh, option. But as you said, it's not needed that often. Um, so, so I think it's uh, the point you brought about this lateral impaction with the meter. That's very important because very often you'll find that if you just try to buttress it from the lateral side, from the medial side, you're not able to get that lateral uh, widening reduced and there I think it's important that you have to also go laterally to get that reduced. Do you find that or what is? Yeah, I think I think it's really important. I think that the um, more often than not, I've been um, um, uh, expectantly not surprised when I go laterally. I almost go laterally. I go very, very often laterally, even if I if I don't see a central lateral depression, just because of the high rate of meniscal injuries on the lateral side that you obviously neglect if you don't look. And, yeah, and, and a point. very small approach. It's it's it takes only five ten minutes. It's really not a big deal. Uh, there's no wound complications usually on the lateral side. Um, so I think it's it's worth doing. You can also employ if if really um, you have a problem um, uh, getting access to the lateral depression. You can do an osteotomy too. There, um, that's been described. You can do that if if necessary. I try to avoid it if 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 I can, but it's absolutely. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward and easy to do. You just put an osteotome, gap it open, get access. Sure. Uh, any other comments from any of the other faculty? Otherwise, we would get on with. No? Okay. So, so we'll uh, continuing with proximal KBR. Uh, 
move over to Greg and the common problem of the bicondylar plateau fractures. When to use single plates and when to use dual plates. Day-to-day -day practical problem. Very good. So let me get back to where I need to be here. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. And the main thing that I wanted to discuss uh, with this talk is the reason uh, for going with two plates versus just one plate. Because this seems to be controversial in the United States, and I'm sure it's controversial in many other places in the world. And you've already seen my disclosures. So I'm the objectives of this talk, this is a big topic, but I'm going to just distill it down to review some methods for comminuted plateau fractures, <clears throat> when to use a single plate, and when to use dual plates, only discussing bicondylar fractures. And I'll review some cases. So bicondylar tibial pl plateau fractures do need stabilization on both sides. Okay, so we can do this in a number of ways. So we can just put a plate on medially and laterally. Or we can just do <coughs> laterally based locked plating. Okay, that will stabilize the medial side. <clears throat> but there are some things that we need to watch out for. So that's why I say beware. Now we can certainly supplement our fixation, our internal fixation with an external fixator, whether it's a ring fixator or a standard single plane external fixator. But I think that most, uh, most surgeons will try if they have the ability just to use internal fixation for, for most tibial plateau fractures. So the question is, when do I need to plate on the medial side? And I would suggest if there is a substantial amount of medial comminution that you should probably consider putting a medial plate on. And if there's a substantial amount of medial displacement on the injury, which would imply a loss of cortical support on the medial side. So you may say, well, <clears throat> what difference does it make if I get good alignment? Why not just reduce it and use a lateral locking plate? So lateral fixed angle implants may work fairly well for injuries like you see here. Okay, so if you look, this is a fairly complex tibial plateau fracture. You can see a very large injury on the CT scan of the lateral plateau with a lot of depression. But you can see this would be a Schatzker 6 type of injury and uh, probably high energy. This would be somebody you would be worried about compartment syndrome. But the important thing to notice is what's going on medially. Okay. There's a tiny bit of comminution, but it looks like you may actually have some place where the cortex will support itself. And so going on to fixing it, this might be a case where a laterally based locked construct that you can see here would be perfectly acceptable, primarily because you've achieved a really good reduction and you have cortex that is touching on the medial side. So you have cortical support. If you think about this, the... Tibia is subject to some varus forces. And so if you're going to use a laterally based plate, then that plate is functioning as a tension band. And you know that tension bands do not work well <clears throat> unless there is support on the opposite side. So it may be that if you have, if you lack support medially, that you will get away with it and it may turn out fine. <clears throat> but you don't want to do that. You would prefer to come close to a guarantee that it will work. In this case, the laterally based, <coughs> excuse me, tension band plate <coughs> is, <coughs> is functioning appropriately, being that you have cortical contact on the medial side. You can, of course, see the small rim plate that was applied as well to help deal with the depressed segments. But the purpose of this case is to show the cortical contact medially with a single locked lateral plate. So there's medial cortical support. <clears throat> so let's look at this patient. This is another patient. This was an open tibial plateau fracture. 
with compartment syndrome that occurred in a motorcycle crash. And you can see a substantial amount of injury to the lateral tibial plateau, but you can see a relatively straightforward medial tibial plateau injury with potentially some good cortical contact. And we were able to exploit this exact uh, problem uh, by using just a laterally based block construct that you see here with good cortical support medially. There was a separate tibial tubercle set of fractures, which was why we placed the medial, excuse me, the anterior plate that you can see here. So what are indications for dual plating? And these, this is where I would suggest that you consider doing dual plating. The first is a bicondylar plateau fracture with significant injury to the medial tibial plateau. The second is a bicondylar tibial plateau fracture with substantial medial condyle displacement like you see here. And the third is a medial tibial plateau fracture only. So this is a Schatzker four, but with a substantial amount of lateral articular injury that you may be able to address better with a lateral rafting plate. <clears throat> so you saw this in my first talk, uh, looking at the idea of an, an anterolateral plate uh, being used to stabilize a posterior medial fracture fragment. You see it doesn't necessarily work very well. This is, a, this is from a paper by Dr. Bure back in 2006, which looks at a proprietary implant of one of the companies. But the bottom line is you can see that the blue screws travel in a particular direction